The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 1, Section 1 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Burnett. The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 1, Section 1. Throughout the vegetable and animal worlds, the sexual functions are periodic. From the usually annual period of flowering in plants, with its play of sperm cell and germ cell and consequent seed production, through the varying sexual energies of animals, up to the monthly effervescence of the generative organism in woman, seeking not without the shedding of blood for the gratification of its reproduction function. From first to last, we have unfailing evidence of the periodicity of sex. At first, the sun, and then some have thought the moon, have marked throughout a rhythmic impress on the phenomena of sex. To understand these phenomena, we have not only to recognize the bare existence of that periodic fact, but to realize its implications. Rhythm, it is scarcely necessary to remark, is far from characterizing sexual activity alone. It is the character of all biological activity, alike on the physical and psychic sides. All the organs of the body appear to be in perpetual process of rhythmic contraction and expansion. The heart is rhythmic, so is the respiration, the spleen is rhythmic, also the bladder. The uterus constantly undergoes regular rhythmic contractions at brief intervals. The vascular system, down to the smallest capillaries, is acted on by three series of vibrations, and every separate fragment of muscular tissue possesses rhythmic contractility. Growth itself is rhythmic, and, as Mollen Hansen and subsequent observers have found, follows a regular annual course as well as a larger cycle. On the psyche sides, attention is rhythmic. We are always irresistibly compelled to impart a rhythm to every succession of sounds, however uniform and monotonous. A familiar example of this is the rhythm we can seldom refrain from hearing in the puffing of an engine. A series of experiments, by Bolton, on 30 subjects showed that the clicks of an electric telephone connected in an induction apparatus nearly always fell into rhythmic groups, usually two or four, rarely three or five the rhythmic perception of being accompanied by a strong impulse to make corresponding muscular movements. It is, however, with the influence to some extent real, to some extent perhaps only apparent of cosmic rhythm that we are here concerned. The general tendency, physical and psychic, of nervous action to fall into rhythm is merely interesting from the present point of view as showing a biological predisposition to accept any periodicity that is habitually imposed upon the organism. Menstruation has always been associated with the lunar revolutions. Darwin, without specifically mentioning menstruation, has suggested that the explanation of the allied cycle of gestation in mammals, as well as in incubation in birds, may be found in the condition under which the Ascidians live at high and low water in consequence of the phenomena of tidal change. It must, however, be remembered that the Ascidian origins of the vertebrate has since been contested from many sides. And even if we admit that all the events of such allied conditions in the early history of vertebrates and their ancestors tended to impress a lunar cycle on the race, it must be still remembered that the monthly periodicity of menstruation only becomes well marked in the human species. Bearing in mind the influence exerted on both the habits and the emotions even of animals by the brightness of moonlight nights, it is, perhaps, not extravagant to suppose that, on organisms already ancestrally predisposed to the influence of rhythm in general, and of cosmic rhythm in particular, the periodically reoccurring full moon, not merely by the stimulation of the nervous system, but possibly by the special opportunities which it gave for the exercise of sexual functions, served to implant a lunar rhythm on menstruation. How important such a factor may be, we have evidence in the fact that the daily life of even the most civilized people is still regulated by a weekly cycle, which is apparently a segment of a cosmic lunar cycle. Monte Gaza has suggested that the sexual period may become established with relation to the lunar period because moonlight nights were favorable to courting, and Nelson remarks that in his experience, young and robust persons are subject to recurrent periods of wakefulness at night in which they attribute to the action of the full moon. One may perhaps refer to also the tendency of bright moonlight to stir the emotions of the young, especially at puberty, a tendency which in neurotic persons may become almost morbid. It is interesting to point out that, the further back we are able to trace the beginnings of culture, the more important we find the part played by the moon. Next to the alteration of day and night, the moon's changes are the most conspicuous and startling phenomena of nature. 
They first suggest a basis for reckoning time. They are the greatest use in primitive agriculture, and everywhere the moon is held to have vast influence on the whole of organic life. Hahn has suggested that the reason why mythological systems do not usually present the moon in the supreme position which we should expect is that its immense importance is so ancient a fact that it tends, with mythological development, to become overlaid by other elements. According to Seller, Quase Cuato and Tezelepoca, the two most considerable figures in the Mexican Pantheon, are to be regarded mainly as complementary forms of the moon divinity, and the moon was the chief Mexican measurer of time. Even in Babylonia, where the sun was most specially revered, at the earliest period the moon ranked higher, being gradually superseded by the worship of the sun. Although such considerations as these by no means take us as far back as the earliest appearance of menstruation, they may serve to indicate that the phases of the moon probably played a large part in the earliest evolution of man. With that statement, we must at present rest content. It is possible that the monthly character of menstruation, while representing a general tendency of the human race, always and everywhere prevalent, may be modified in the future. It is a noteworthy fact that among many primitive races menstruation only occurs at long intervals. Thus, among Eskimo women, menstruation follows the peculiar cosmic condition to which the people are subjected. Cook, the ethnologist of the Perry North Greenland expedition, found that menstruation only began after the age of 19, and that it was usually suppressed during the winter months, when there was no sun, only about 1 in 10 women continuing to menstruate during this period. It was stated by Velpiu that Lapland and Greenland women usually only menstruate every three months, or even only two or three times during the year. On the Faroe Islands, it is said that menstruation is frequently absent. Among the Samoyeds, Montegaza mentions that menstruation is so slight that some travelers have denied its existence. Azara noted among the Guaranis of Paraguay that menstruation was not only slight in amount, but the periods were separated by long intervals. Among the Indians in North America, again, menstruation appears to be scanty. Thus, Holder, speaking of his experience in the Crow Indians of Montana, says, I am quite sure that full-blooded Indians in this latitude do not menstruate so freely as white women, not usually exceeding three days. Among the naked women of Tierra de Fuego, it is said that there is often no physical sign of menses for six months at a time. These observations are noteworthy, though they clearly indicate, on the whole, that primitiveness in race is very powerless factor without a cold climate. On the other hand, again, there is some reason to suppose that in Europe there is a latent tendency in some women for the menstrual cycle to split up further into two cycles, by the appearance of a latent minor climax in the middle of the monthly interval. I allude to the phenomena usually called mittelschmerz, middle period or intermenstrual pain. Since the investigations of Goodman, Stevenson, Van Ott Reynel, Jacobi, and others, it has been generally recognized that the menstruation is a continuous process, the flow being merely the climax of a menstrual cycle, a physiological wave which is in constant flux or reflux. This cycle manifests itself in all a woman's activities, in metabolism, respiration, temperature, etc., as well as on the nervous and psychic sides. The healthier the woman is, the less conscious the cyclic return of her life. But the cycle may be traced, as Hedger has found, even before puberty takes place. While Serlini has found that even in amenorrhea, the menstrual cycle still manifests itself in the temperature and respiration. For a summary of the phenomena of menstrual cycle, see Havelock Ellis, Man and Woman, 4th edition, revised and enlarged, Chapter 11, The Functional Periodicity of Women. Mittelschmerz is a condition of pain occurring about the middle of the intermenstrual period, either alone or accompanied by a slight sanguineous discharge, or more frequently, a non-sanguineous discharge. The phenomena varies, but seems usually to occur about the 14th day, and to last two or three days. Laycock, in 1840, gave instances of women with an intermenstrual period. De Paul and Genoi speak of an intermenstrual symptoms and even actual flow as occurring in women who are in a perfect state of health and constituting genuine regularis sumnimaris. The condition is, however, said to have been first fully described by Valix, then, in 18,725, 
by Sir William Priestley, and subsequently by Failing Fassbinder, Sorrel, Halliday Croom, Finley Adensell, and others. Also, Flies goes so far as to assert that an intermenstrual period of menstrual symptoms, which terms Neben menstruation, is a phenomena well known to most healthy women. Observations are at present too few to allow any definite conclusions, and in some of the cases, so far recorded a pathological condition of the sexual organs has been found to exist. Rosner of Kakao, however, found that only one case out of twelve was there any disease present, and Storer, who has met with twenty cases, insists on the remarkable and definite regularity of the manifestations, wholly unlike those of neurologia. There is no agreement as to the cause of Mittelschmerz. Adensel attributed to the disease of the fallopian tubes. This, however, is denied by such competent authorities as Cullingworth and Bland Sutton. Others, like Priestley and subsequent Marsh, have thought to find the explanation in the occurrence of ovulation. This theory is, however, unsupported by facts and eventually rests on the exploited belief that ovulation is the cause of menstruation. Rosner, following Richelieu, vaguely attributes it to the diffused hyperemia which is generally present. Van de Velde also attributed it to abnormal fall of vascular tone, causing passive congestion of pelvic vascura. Others again, like Armand Routh and Michelin, in the course of an interesting discussion on Mittelschmerz in the Obstetric Society of London, on the second day of March, 1898, believe that we may trace here a double menstruation and would explain the phenomena by assuming that, in certain cases, there is intramural as well as menstrual cycle. The question is not yet ripe for settlement, though it is fully evident that, looking broadly at the phenomena of rut and menstruation, the main basis of their increasing frequency, as we rise towards civilized man, is the increase of nutrition, heat and sunlight being factors of nutrition. When dealing with civilized man, however, we are probably concerned not merely with general nutrition, but with the nervous direction of that nutrition. At this stage, it is natural to inquire what the corresponding phenomena are among animals. Unfortunately, imperfect, as is our comprehension of the human phenomena, our knowledge of the corresponding phenomena among animals is much more fragmentary and incomplete. Among most animals, menstruation does not exist, being replaced by what is known as heat or cestra, which usually occurs once or twice a year, in spring and in autumn, sometimes affecting the male as well as the female. There is, however, a great deal of progression in the upward march of the phenomena as we approach our own and allied zoological series. Heat in domesticated cows usually occurs every three weeks. The female hippopotamus in the zoological gardens has been observed to exhibit monthly sexual excitement with swelling and secretion from the vulva. Progression is not only towards greater frequency with higher evolution or with increased domestication, but there is also a change in the character of the flow. As Wiltshire, in his remarkable lectures on the comparative physiology of menstruation, asserted as a law, the more highly evolved the animal, the more sanguineous the catamenial flow. It is not until we reach the monkeys that this character of the flow becomes well marked. Monthly sanguineous discharges have been observed among many monkeys. In the 17th century, various observers in many parts of the world, Bonius, Perrier, Helbigius, Van der Weyl, and others noted menstruation in monkeys. Buffon observed it among various monkeys as well as the orangutan. J. G. St. Hilaire and Cuvier, many years ago, declared that menstruation exists among a variety of monkeys and lower apes. Renger described the vaginal discharge in a species of Sibius in Paraguay, while Rakiborski observed the Jardin de plants that the menstrual hemorrhage in genuines was so abundant, the floor of the cage was covered by it to a considerable extent. The same variety of monkey was observed by Surinam, by Hill, a surgeon in the Dutch army, who noted an abundant sanguineous flow occurring at every new moon and lasting about three days, the animal at this time also showing signs of sexual excitement. The macaque and the baboon appear to be the non-human animals in which menstruation has been most carefully observed. In the former, besides the flow, Bland Sutton remarks that all the naked or pale-colored parts of the body, such as the face, neck, ischial regions, assume a lively pink color. In some cases, it is a vivid red. The flow is slight, but the coloring lasts several days, and in warm weather, the labia are much swollen. 
Heap has most fully and carefully described menstruation in monkeys. He found in Calcutta that the Macacus cynomologus menstruated regularly on the 20th of December, 20th of January, and about the 20th of February. The Cynocyphilus porcaria and the Semopithecus entellius both menstruated each month for about four days. At the Macacae, Rhesus, and Cynomogalus, at menstruation, the nipples and vulva become swollen and deeply congested, and the skin of the buttocks swollen, tense, and of a brilliant red or even purple color. The abdominal wall also, for a short space upward, and inside of the thighs, sometimes as far down as the heel, and the undersurface of the tail for half its length or more, are all covered in a vivid red, while the skin of the face, especially about the eyes, is flushed or blotched with red. In the late gestation, the coloring is still more vivid. Something similar is to be seen in the males also. Distant, who kept a female baboon for some time, has recorded the dates of menstruation during the year. He found that nine periods occurred during the year. The average length between the periods was nearly six weeks, but they occurred more frequently in the late autumn and in the winter than in the summer. It is an interesting fact, Heap noted, that notwithstanding menstruation, the seasonal influence, or rut, still persisted in the monkeys he investigated. In the anthropoid apes, Hartman remarks that several observers have recorded periodic menstruation in the chimpanzee, with flushing and enlargement of the external parts, and protrusion of the external lips, which were not usually visible, while there is often excessive enlargement and reddening of these parts and of the posterior callicites during sexual excitement. Very little, however, appears to be definitely known regarding any form of menstruation in the higher apes. M. Deichner, who has made a special study of the anthropoid apes, informs me that he has so far been able to make definite observations regarding the existence of menstruation. Ma remarks that he received information regarding such a phenomena in the orangutan. A pair of orangutans was kept in the Berlin Zoological Garden some years ago, and the female was stated to have, at intervals, a menstrual flow resembling that of a woman, and during this period to refrain from sexual congress, which was otherwise usually exercised at regular intervals, at least every two or three days. Ma adds, however, that while his informant is a reliable man, the length of time that has elapsed may have led him to mistake in details. Keith, in a paper read before the Zoological Society of London, has described the menstruation in a chimpanzee. It occurred every 23rd or 24th day and lasted for three days. The discharge was profuse, at first appeared in about the ninth or 10th year. End of The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 1, Section 1.